Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you because of this day. We praise your name because you have given us the whole Bible containing the promises, containing the provisions through Christ Jesus. Father, we are calling upon you that the provisions you have given us in what we study today will be ours in Jesus' name. We're asking that in your faithfulness, in your mercy, and in your love, you'll fulfill to all waiting, ready disciples of Jesus Christ here tonight your promise in Jesus' name. Open our understanding to understand the scriptures and help us to have and manifest the faith which we to appropriate all that you have provided for us. In Jesus' name we pray. We're continuing with our study of Acts of the Apostles. Already we have gone through chapter 1 of Acts, and tonight we're starting a study of Acts chapter 2. We'll be studying the first four verses of Acts chapter 2. These are the very words of God written down by an individual called Luke, a child of God himself and a minister of God who was anointed and inspired of the Holy Spirit to put all these down. And we're told in these verses how the long-expected blessing came upon the children of God. Now from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. These important words that we find at the beginning of this chapter match the difference between what the church was before this day of Pentecost and what the church became after the day of Pentecost. It gave the church a dynamic beginning in Jerusalem. It gave the church the manifestation of great power in Jerusalem that on this very day we're reading about today, that 3,000 came to the Lord Jesus Christ, saved, and they became steadfast in the Lord. Actually, the apostles and disciples had been waiting for this day. For the time when the Holy Ghost will come upon them, like we're reading here today. It was a long anticipated day. They expected it. A new era in God's gracious dealings with mankind was beginning. God the Father was now intending to keep his promise, and Jesus Christ the Son was to pour out the Spirit according to what John the Baptist had said, that I indeed baptize so with water. But he that is greater than I, the one that is coming, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus Christ was about to pour out the Spirit upon them, Joel's prophecy. Reaching some years before this time, was about to be fulfilled. But unknown to the Jews, they were just keeping their normal feast which at this time had been called Pentecost, and thousands of them had gathered in Jerusalem. In fact, we're told that sometimes we'll have more than 180,000 coming to worship in Jerusalem, and more than 120,000 of them could be pilgrims from other countries where the Jews had been scattered. They'll come back to Jerusalem, 
and they will come to worship at this particular time. The disciples had been waiting. I told you before, according to Acts chapter 1 verse 15, there were 120 of them. They were all together in one place in one accord. And the day came that they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now because of the lack of knowledge in the church at large, concerning the baptism with and in the Holy Ghost, we're going to be very, very slow because we need to lay line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, there's so much confusion about this experience in the church. There are believers who feel that the baptism with the Holy Spirit was only for the apostles. And once the apostles had the experience, other people, whether in the early church or today, are not supposed to be asking for the experience. Other people feel that the experience was only for believers of the early church, apostles and disciples. But today, the promise is no more to be expected by those of us who are getting saved today. Other people say, no, that is not right. The experience is for everybody. But the only thing is that you get everything at the same time. The day you are saved is the day you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. You are born and baptized with the Holy Spirit at the same time. You are born again, you are renewed, and you have this eternal life. And at the same time, you have had with your parcel the Holy Ghost upon you. Other people say, well, it's a later experience, subsequent to salvation. But then there is no evidence today of speaking in tongues or speaking with other languages which you have never learned before. They feel, well, you have the Holy Ghost in such a quiet uh, way that, you know, there is no evidence. You just have it and you know you have it. Well, who is right, who is wrong? Well, just study the Bible slowly so that there will be no doubt in your heart why all this is in the Bible. And you will have no doubt at all what is the plan of God for today. And in these four verses we're going to study today, we're looking at the expectation of the promise, the explanation of Pentecost, the evidence of Paraclete's arrival. Paraclete is a comforter, the Holy Ghost. And then the endowment of power, as well as the experience of pioneers and the rest of the people. Now it says in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The question is, why were they with one accord in one place? Why didn't they scatter all about? Why did they remain together, as I told you last week, in unanimous obedience, unconditional oneness, united prayer and worship, as well as humility? Why did they remain together like that, in obedience, yieldedness, submission, and in one accord? Well, they remained together because there was a great expectation. The Lord Jesus had talked to them very much about the Holy Ghost. And the expectation was very high. And because of the expectation of fulfilling the promise, that's why they remained together in the upper room with one accord in one place. As far back as Matthew chapter 3, from verse 11, Jesus had given them the promise through the utterance of John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was sent by God, and he was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, and all he said was sanctioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we are told about the promise. All these promises showed why they were in great expectation. While they were waiting, tarrying for that point in Jerusalem, John said, and Jesus backed him up, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Look at this. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
But you know, you don't need fire if there is nothing to burn. If you want to remain cold, you don't need fire. If you don't want, want the warmth and the heat of heaven coming upon you, there is no need for fire. But you know, the disciples were in great expectation. They had got something to burn. They wanted all the chaff in their lives to be burned. The chaff means the things that ought not to be there. Not things that are sinful or evil or wicked, but just things that are useless. Not fit to be in their lives. They want everything to be burnt away. And because they had something to burn, because they wanted to be on fire for God, they wanted to be hot for the Lord, they were waiting. And therefore they were in great expectation. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 18, here Jesus was talking. And he said, And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought. How? Or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. That's why they were in great expectation. They knew that the Pharisees and Sadducees will come to lay hold on them. They will lay their hands on them. They will bring them before judges and magistrates and governors and kings. And they knew that with their own foolishness, they will not be able to answer them. And Jesus, I told them, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, if you ask any question from the Pharisees and Sadducees, from the kings and governors, he will give you that same hour, what ye shall speak. And because they wanted the fulfillment of that promise, they were waiting in great expectation for the Holy Ghost. Mark it down. The apostles were not waiting for speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues came together with the blessing. But they were not waiting for just speaking in tongues. Many things were associated with the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And they wanted everything without exception. In Mark chapter 16... Verse 17 and verse 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly sin, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and it shall recover. You know, you are now seeing the reasons why they were waiting in great expectation. They wanted the signs to follow them. And they knew that these signs will not come except they obeyed in unity, in love, in submission to the Lord. Waiting, as they told them to wait in Jerusalem. Five things there that, were, that they were waiting for. They had cast out devils before, but sometimes they failed. And they were looking for a time when there will be no failure at all. Immediately they will command the evil spirit to come out. It, that evil spirit will come out. Not casting out and binding and loosing and, you know, waiting and praying for one hour. Just within a moment, they speak against the devil. That devil will have to come out. They wanted that. That's why they were waiting. And then it says, if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They knew that the time could come when people could try to injure them. And they may try to give them poison unknown to them. And they were wanting to have that power, the Holy Ghost upon them, that if they drank it, it will not hurt them than to speak in tongues. You see, that is just one of the things that come together with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And if you have been cheating yourself, and you have been baptized with the Holy Ghost, and the only thing you have, the only evidence you have is speaking with tongues, you are far, far behind of the New Testament experience. And then it says, verse 18, they shall take up serpents. That means if serpents, uh, the snakes come, even though the snakes may bite them, they just uh, switch it off and throw it away because it will not be able to hurt them. Then it says, 
They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so you see that they were expecting because of the promises they had that could only be fulfilled in the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter 21, from verse 12. But before this, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony, settle it therefore in your heart, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom that all your adversaries shall not be able to gain say or resist. That was to come with the Holy Ghost. You know, when the Holy Ghost comes, it's just like receiving a whole box of blessings. And then you begin to take the blessing one by one, and it covers every area of your life. And as we look at all these promises, you can see what the disciples and the apostles were expecting. You can see all the things they would miss if they did not have the Holy Ghost in the baptismal measure. He told them, I'll give you a mouth and I'll give you wisdom that all your enemies and adversaries shall not be able to resist or gain say. Now in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I sent the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He told them again that you'll have wisdom, you'll have a supernatural type of mouth, You'll have boldness. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you'll have fire upon you. And everything that is chaff, everything that is useless and unprofitable to you, will be burnt up by the fire of the Holy Ghost. But now he's telling them that they'll be endued or they'll be closed and covered, that's the Greek, with power from on high. In John chapter 7, Verse 37 to verse 39. And in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. They have believed on him, they have had eternal life, they were saved. But the Holy Ghost was to come upon them in, in the future, which means it was at a later time, saved first. Then later, the baptism in the Holy Spirit will come. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was telling them that you are now saved, but there are times you feel dry. There are times you pray and it, it appears that heaven is closed up. It appears that there is a ceiling above you and your prayers do not go beyond the ceiling. The peers were knocking at a hard heaven like iron. But when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, it will be like rivers of living water gushing out of you. The apostles wanted that. They wanted prayer to become so much easier. For the rivers of the Holy Ghost, rivers of living water flowing out continually from them to bless the people all around them. No wonder the expectation was great and high. In John chapter 14, verse 12, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. You can imagine the disciples saying this marvelous, wonderful promise. And he called all these disciples together. And he said, now, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me. Or else, believe me for the very work's sake. They were excited. Their faces lit up. But then he gave them an unbelievable promise. A wonderful promise in this verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works I do, shall he do also. That's in the future. Shall he do also. He has believed on me. But a time is coming in his life when the works I do, the miracles I perform, he shall do. And greater works than these shall he do also. I can imagine the disciples and the apostles saying, give it, give it to us now, give it to us now. Jesus said, no, I must go to the Father first because I go unto my Father. Why does it have to wait until you go to the Father? Because if I go not to the Father, the Holy Ghost cannot come. I go to the Father, then the Holy Ghost will come down. And then at that time, you will do the works that I do and the greater works than I have done. No wonder they were excited. No wonder there was great expectation and anticipation. They were waiting for the time when they will be able to do everything Jesus did. And they will be able to do greater works than that. And in verse 13, and whatsoever, after I've gone to the Father and I've sent the Holy Ghost upon you, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. That's talking about the Holy Ghost. Another comforter. Look at verse 26 and see who the Lord Jesus is calling the comforter. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost. Whom the Father will send in my name. Come back to verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you. How long? That's why the disciples were excited forever. Jesus called them at the beginning of his ministry. And then, at the end of uh, three and a half years, he said, disciples, I'm going away. The Jews will take me, they will kill me. You will not see me anymore. How about the miracles? How about the power, the power you are manifesting? How about healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers? Well, another person is coming. Another person, the Godhead. The Holy Ghost is coming. He will do all that I've been doing through you. But, uh, well, suppose he comes and you are now going away after three and a half years. And then maybe after three and a half years, he too will want to go away. And Jesus said, no, no, no. When he comes, he is going to abide with you forever. No wonder the disciples were excited. They were waiting. They wanted him. Because this is another uh, comforter that he was uh, going to give to them. And in John, when he said another comforter, that's in verse 16. He shall give you another comforter. I told you before that the word another is uh, actually two Greek words in Greek. And one means another of the same kind. The other one means another of a different kind. But the word that Jesus used, alos, means another of the same kind. As gentle as myself, as uh, loving as myself, as great as myself as powerful as myself. In fact, it's another of the same kind, another comforter. And when he comes, he will abide with you forever. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. You are saved, he dwelleth with you. And he shall be in you. 
I will not leave you comfortless. In the Greek, orphanos, which means I will not leave you as an orphan without any guide, without any leader, without any teacher. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. When the Holy Ghost comes, then it will be just that he comes to comfort, he comes to abide, he comes to care, he comes to guide. In verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which the Father will send in my name. Look at this. He shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, my brother, my sister, look up at me here. You know, today as you have come, you want to receive the Holy Ghost. And if we ask the average person here, why do you want to have the Holy Ghost? Well, I want to be able to speak in tongues when I pray. My brother, my sister, it's much more than that. Much more than that. Much, much more than that. I see people speak in tongues and they feel lonely. So lonely like they are orphans. I see people speak in tongues and you preach and give a message on Thursday. You tell them what did we say on Thursday. You ask them on Sunday, they can't remember. But you know, when the Holy Ghost has come, number one, he will teach you all things. If you really have the Holy Ghost, my brother, my sister, listen to me, it will become difficult, difficult, difficult to get into false doctrine. Because he'll teach you all things. As soon as false doctrine comes your way, the Holy Ghost will say, no, 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 don't go that way. You know, he is the spirit of truth. And he will be teaching you truth. He shall teach you all things. You know, the doctrines in the Bible that may appear difficult to solve about rapture, about tribulation, about the great tribulation, about the millennial reign, about many things in the Bible that may seem puzzling to the average person. When the Holy Ghost has come, he'll just make everything simply, simple for you. And then he will bring to your remembrance all that I have taught you. Whatsoever I've said unto you, he'll bring everything to your remembrance. That's why they were waiting for the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. Matthew could never write the gospel according to St. Matthew without having the Holy Ghost. Why? Because when those things were happening, they were not writing things down. They were just following Jesus to Galilee, to Judea, to the seaside, listening to the Sermon on the Mount. And years later, think about it. Jesus preached that Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And then Matthew began to write. And he remembered where Jesus sat. He remembered what Jesus said. And remembered every word of the long sermon. How could he do it? The Holy Ghost had come upon him. How could Mark write down everything? Luke write down everything? How could John write down everything? You know when John wrote? John wrote around 95 AD. About 60 years after Jesus Christ had died, buried, and was uh, resurrected, and had gone to heaven. And after 60 years, he put his pen on paper, and he began to write the gospel according to St. John. Now, if I ask you what we preached five years ago, can you remember? You cannot. But you see, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, the Holy Ghost brought to their remembrance all that had been said. That's why they were waiting for the Holy Ghost, because they wanted that Holy Ghost to come, and then they'll be able to remember what Jesus has spoken to them. Chapter 15 of John, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth, from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. You'll know Jesus more. The beauty of Jesus. The glory of Jesus. The wisdom of Jesus. The power of Jesus. The fulfillment of the promise of Jesus. The state of Jesus now. And the plan of a Jesus in coming back. You will know everything because when the Holy Ghost has come, every time he's talking to you, he will testify of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. The apostles and disciples did not have the New Testament at that time. All they had was the Old Testament. From Genesis to 
Malachi. Do you know what happened after the Holy Ghost came upon them? The Holy Ghost came upon them and then people gathered together and they were listening to them. And, uh, you know, surprisingly, Peter or any of the other apostles will start preaching about Abraham. He will start about Abraham and before he says ten sentences, already will come to Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Even though it was an Old Testament reference or Bible, they had. Anywhere they read in the Old Testament, they will talk about Jesus Christ because that Holy Ghost came. And anytime they were reading Genesis, they will be testifying about Jesus Christ. They read Exodus about the Passover, about the feasts, about the sacrifices. The Holy Ghost will testify in Exodus about Jesus Christ. They read Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy. Anywhere they read in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost will be saying, that is about Jesus, that is about Jesus, because he shall testify of me. How many times have you read Old Testament and you say, what do they mean here? Well, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, anywhere you read in the Bible, you will see Jesus there, because the Holy Ghost will testify of Jesus. And you see many people today who profess to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have such a limited view of having the Holy Ghost that all they do is so limited. But you know, the Holy Ghost really comes upon you and it becomes wonderful. Much light is thrown on the Bible for you. Chapter 16 of John. From verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, that message is profitable for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, listen to this, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. What's that saying? That is saying that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you are preaching, no matter how long or how short, the Holy Ghost will convict sinners of their sins. How many times have you been preaching? In the bus, in the home, you talk, talk, and talk, and all the sinners will be looking at you like this. They'll never repent. They'll never be convicted. You'll describe their sin. You will label their sin. You will enumerate their sin. You will paint their sin. You will make them afraid. You will talk about hellfire, about judgment, about perdition, about being lost forever and forever. And they'll be looking at you like this. There'll be no conviction. And Jesus is saying, no man can convict another man of sin, but the Holy Ghost, when he's come, he will convict them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believed not on me. Of righteousness because I go unto my Father. And you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And now Jesus said something that blew their mind. In verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you. But ye cannot receive them now. How be it? When the, Holy, when the Spirit of truth is come... He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That's why they were waiting for the Holy Ghost, because they knew that they didn't know enough. And in Acts chapter 1, just before Jesus left, the parting words of Jesus are these. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized of the Holy Ghost not many days since, but ye shall receive power. Verse 8, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in, all, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I'm showing you, my brother, my sister, that this is the reason there was so much expectation on the part of the disciples and the apostles. They were waiting in great expectation and in great faith, and they received the blessing they were waiting for. Now let me say a word about Pentecost. Come to 
chapter 2 verse 1 and when the day of Pentecost was fully come what, what does that word mean? Pentecost the word Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50th now you must listen because I'm sure many of us are not familiar with the things in the Old Testament in Exodus, Leviticus and Deuteronomy we're told that three times the Israelites who are men especially those who are from 20 years upward they expected to come to the city where God will put his name three times in the year. The first time will be the time of the Passover. Then the feast of the unleavened bread was to gather them together. Now in the, the harvest will start and it will start that at the time of the Passover. And you know the Passover time when the lamp was slain, the lamp without blemish. And all the Jews will commemorate that because that uh, makes them to remember when God brought them out of Egypt. Then the harvest time has started. The first fruit is the time they will make, they will wave the fruit before the Lord as a sacrifice before the Lord. They will keep a whole week of unleavened bread. And then on the 50th day, which was seven weeks after, seven weeks will be 49 days. And the day after that will be the 50th day, which is Pentecost. They will conclude that harvest and the sacrifice before the Lord. And it will normally bring all the Jews together to the place where God has put his name. First, it was in Shiloh at the time of Eli, but later it was changed to Jerusalem. And for many years now, people had been coming to Jerusalem. And this time, they came again to observe the Feast of Pentecost. Look at it from verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation from under heaven. Now in verse 9, these were the people that came to Jerusalem at this time because of the fears, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and in Cappadocia, and in Pontus and in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, all these Jews from all these places came together because it was a feast of Pentecost. Now to understand that the time was a common time, look at chapter 20, verse 16. Acts chapter 20, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because they would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So that makes you to understand that the day of Pentecost was a normal day. Like uh, we talk about Christmas today. And you know most religious uh, people would like to go to their village to celebrate Christmas at a particular time. Now, Pentecost Day of Pentecost was not called that day because the Holy Ghost came. The day of Pentecost had been called that day of Pentecost before Jesus was even born physically in the world here. Now, Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were always one accord in one place. I told you before that means they were saved, they were sanctified, they were obedient, they were united, they were humble. And they were together in one place. There was no discord. There was no disagreement. There was no argument about doctrine at all. They were just with one accord in one place. And if you are waiting for the power today, it must be because you are already saved. And then you have fulfilled this condition. God has sanctified you by the purifying blood of Jesus Christ. And you are in one accord with the saints of God. Now, let's see the evidence of Paraclete's arrival. Paraclete in Greek is Paracletos. And uh, that is what in our King James Version of the Bible is translated comforter. But um, scholars in Greek have told us that 
the Greek word parakletos is difficult to translate into English because it has uh, the meaning of comforter and counselor, helper, that is somebody who comes along your side to help you, an advocate, an intercessor, a strengthener who comes to empower you and a standby, who comes, uh, you know, just to stand by whatever you need any moment. And therefore, that's why you have the English word paraclete. You have that in some books and in some writings of uh, theologians. Now, when the whole Holy Ghost has come, what is the evidence? What evidence do we see? Let's see in Acts chapter 2 from verse 2. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting now here they were prayerfully sitting down they were expectantly sitting down they were anticipating hoping looking or believing god they didn't know when the day will come they had been in prayer and in worship and all their hearts were toward heaven they knew the benefits when the holy ghost will come and therefore they were prayerfully sitting down at this time you know, the Holy Ghost can come upon you while you're praying and standing, praying and sitting, praying and leaning. The posture does not matter to God. This teaches us something. It is not your physical state that hinders or invites the Holy Ghost. It is your spiritual state. It is not how you feel. You know, sometimes when you're sitting down, you don't feel, uh, you know, very spiritual. Some people don't like sitting down whenever they are praying. They feel more convenient whenever they're kneeling down. But you know, the Lord is teaching us here that if you're kneeling down, if your heart is right with God, if you're standing up, if your heart is right with God, if you're sitting down, your heart is right with God, if you're lying down, your heart is right with God, it's all right. The Holy Ghost will come. Look up at me here. I, I, I met a pastor, Reverend Porter. He's not going to glory, he's going to meet Jesus Christ. And um, I was discussing with him and sharing with him how the Lord, you know, baptized me in the Holy Ghost and how I received the blessing of the Lord. And he said, well, he wanted to share his experience with me. And I said, you, I, I'd like to hear. And you know what happened? That uh, he went to a place to listen to the word of God. That's why he lived at the time of uh, Smith Wigglesworth. Miss Wigglesworth died in the 40s, but he was already a believer then. And then the day he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, he was lying on the ground. And the Holy Ghost came upon him, and he started uh, speaking in tongues. Then later he became a pastor. After he became a pastor, you know what he did? He'll talk to people and he'll get saved. He'll talk to people and they'll readjust their lives and let the sanctifying blood purify their hearts. And then he'll tell them to come together for the Holy Ghost. You remember the way he received? He was lying down and the Holy Ghost came upon him and he started speaking in tongues and the power of God started manifesting his life. And in the church, he, he made small pillows. So whenever they came to receive the Holy Ghost, he will explain to them, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. You must believe the Lord. Now he will tell them his testimony. When I received, I was lying down. I met him myself as a potter. And then he will tell them, now lie down. And they put their head on the pillow and they start praying. And the Holy Ghost will come upon them. And then he will tell other people, you see, other, you see those people they received when they were lying down. Until one day, he, he read this passage and he saw that they were sitting down. What is the Lord teaching us? It doesn't matter whether you are sitting or lying down. on the. You know sometimes you are lying down on the bed and you are praying. And the Holy Ghost can come upon you. Or you are sitting down and you are praying. Or you are standing up and you are praying. Or you are kneeling down and you are praying. Don't let us make rules for other people. This is the way I got it and this is the way you must get it. Now look at verse 2 again. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind listen to me it doesn't say that the wind blew on the house you know some people say well i am waiting when the sound and the wind will come and will blow in the church and blow this building down then we'll know that the holy ghost has come it says only sound as of the sound 
resembled the sound of a rushing mighty wind. The Greek uh, word translated uh, mighty wind here is blast. That is the blast of uh, God, the breath of God. Remember how man was created in Genesis? He was uh, made out of clay, and then God breathed upon him, and he became a living soul. And here, the blast, the breath of God, the sound of a rushing mighty wind, the sound of the blast of the breath of God, and that sound filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Not fire, like as of fire, resembling fire. It appeared unto them. It didn't appear on to unbelievers, but just to them, to the waiting, watching ones, to the tarrying ones, to the ones that were expecting. It appeared only unto them. And it sat upon each of them. I saw a picture, I think it was last year of people receiving the Holy Ghost and they drew 12 people and then they made signs like fire coming upon the 12 uh, people. But you know that is wrong. They were 120. And the picture I saw did not only just draw 12, but 12 men. There were men and women here. And there were 120 of them. And that cloving tongue, like as of fire, sat on each of them. All the 120 received. Now verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. The Greek word is glossa, and it means language. It doesn't mean gibberish. It means language. It doesn't mean baby talk. It means language. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, glossa in Greek, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now this to them was the evidence of the arrival of Paracletus, the Paraclete, the Holy Ghost, or the Comforter. He came upon them, and he gave them utterance, and they started speaking with other languages. Now, was this the only time that people spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came? No. Look at chapter 10 of Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. What was the evidence there? Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues, glosser, tongues, languages, and magnified God. Magnified God. In chapter 19, Acts chapter 19. Verse 2, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Then he instructed them, he taught them, and now he was going to minister to them. Verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. What was the evidence? They spake with tongues and prophesied. They spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men, this was not, this is not Jerusalem, this is Ephesus. And all the men were about twelve. And so in the early church, this was the evidence of the Holy Ghost coming upon them. Please listen to me. I didn't say this was a full result of the Holy Ghost coming upon them. I said this was the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost coming upon them. The results were many. The miracle that came upon them 
was much. Because power came on them, boldness came on them, wisdom came on them, faith was increased and energized in them. Revelation came on them, understanding came on them, bringing to their remembrance all that Jesus had said came upon them. The Holy Ghost started testifying of Jesus Christ in every passage they read. Those were the resolves, but the initial evidence was speaking in tongues. Now, let's come back to Acts chapter 2 again and... Here we ought to be very, very vigilant. I don't want you to have an experience that is limited. You think about salvation, for example. Suppose I was giving my testimony of salvation. I said, when the, when the Lord saved my soul, I had the joy of salvation. And that is true. And whenever you are saved, you always have joy. But... That is just evidence. The results of my salvation is not only joy, I had eternal life. The results of my salvation, not only joy, I had peace of mind. The results of my salvation included my being translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. It included the whole of redemption. It included uh, all condemnation totally gone. There is no condemnation now for them that are in Christ Jesus walking after the spirit and not in the flesh. So I don't go about just saying the all that I have, all that I have in salvation is joy, 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 joy. I have much more than that. The same thing when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, it's not only speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is just the initial evidence. You have seen all that I've been reading to you. Now I'm talking about endowment of power. When the Holy Ghost comes, there is endowment of power. And this is what they received in Acts chapter 2 from verses 2 to 4. Don't miss that. It must be your experience. Luke chapter 24 again, verse 49. Behold, I sent the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Until ye be endued with power from on high. My brother, my sister, they were not waiting for tongues. They were waiting for power. When you get saved, when you were looking for salvation, you were not waiting for joy. You were waiting for eternal life. Eternal life is a real thing. The joy is just the evidence to tell you that eternal life has come. We're waiting for power. We're waiting for wisdom. We're waiting for the great manifestation of faith. We're waiting for endowment with power and wisdom. Only that the initial evidence is speaking in tongues. We cannot emphasize this too much because there is so much misunderstanding about that. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power. That's the central thing. That's the essential thing. The tongues will come. Praise God it will come. But the real thing that you are waiting for, that must come upon you when the Holy Ghost comes as a power, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And with that power ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Please follow me. The Holy Ghost is associated with power, and power is associate, associated with the Holy Ghost many places of the Bible. Let me just show you a few. Micah chapter 3, verse 8. If you can't open as fast as I open, just listen to me. Micah chapter 3, verse 8. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. And of judgment, and of might, and that power is to make me declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. In Luke chapter 1, verse 17, just listen to the references I read. It shall go before thee in the spirit and power of Elias. The spirit and the power, you see them joined together. Verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. They go together. The Holy Ghost comes, power comes. 
power is there because the Holy Spirit is there. In Luke chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. In the power of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, verses 31 and 33. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Look at verse 33. And with great power. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Chapter 10 of Acts, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Holy Ghost and power. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Verses 18 and 19. For I will not dare speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me. To make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through, the, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. By the power of the Spirit of God. The power and the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and uh, of power. And so from these references, you see that actually, when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Ghost comes upon us, power is a central thing. Power is a major thing. And when that power comes upon you, boldness also will come together with it. Now, some people say that these are just the experiences of apostles alone. But uh, we're written here, it's the experience of both the pioneers and the people. Let's see what the Bible says. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. It's not only for the apostles, it's also for all the disciples. It's not only for the men, it's also for the women. It's not only for those who are high-ranking in society. It's also for those who are lowly. It's for masters and servants, for the free and for the bond, for the men and for the women, and it's for both the Jew and the Gentile, for the young and the old. In um, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, And they were all filled. And they were all filled. Now, what does it mean to be filled? When the Bible talks of being filled, it means uh, being totally controlled, saturated with what you are filled with. Think about a man filled with anger. He's totally controlled by anger. His emotions, his heart, his spirit, his mind, his brain, everything about him, even his mouth, his tongue, is yielded to that anger because he's filled with anger. He has yielded the total control of his life to anger. That's why he's filled with anger. And at that time, he cannot be joyful and be angry at the same time. Happy and angry at the same time. He cannot manifest another, sense, another emotion with that anger because he's full of age. Think about a man full of joy. He's totally joyful. He cannot be joyful and sorrowful at the same time. The reins of his life, the controls of his life are totally surrendered unto that joy. Now, when a man is full of the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, that means his heart is, you know, just totally controlled. His spirit is totally controlled. Even his tongue is totally controlled with the Holy Ghost that has saturated him. Verse 4. And they were all, mark the word in your Bible, all. If you're a believer, and if you're in one accord with the believers, if the Lord has touched your life, if the Lord has cleansed your life, if the blood of Jesus has done the full and final work in your life, if you are righteous by the grace of the Lord, you are part of that all. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to emphasize the word all because that is where you come in. 
we have read about the great expectation, expectation for the promise. We have read about the explanation of Pentecost, and this is our Pentecost there. Many people are gathered here tonight, looking out to the Lord, that the Lord will fulfill the promise that he has given. And here we are, because the paraclete has arrived, and we're going to have the evidence of his arrival in Jesus' name. And I've told you that the centrals and the essentials and the foundation of all that we're experiencing tonight is the power, the endowment of power. And when that power comes, it will be dynamite. And now it's the experience for everybody, pioneers and people. It says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, that's exactly what the prophecy of Joel said. Look at verse 18. Let's see it from verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all flesh, all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, men and women, shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So the old men can come into it and the young men can come into it. On my servants... And on my handmaidens will I pour out of my, in those days of my spirit, and he shall prophesy. In verse 38 and verse 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized everyone in the name, every, of, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mark verse 39. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Has the Lord called you? Have you responded to the call? Have you been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Has he cleansed your spirit? Has he totally recreated you? Are you now living by the righteousness of Christ? And the life you now live, are you living by the cleansing of the blood that Jesus Christ has done? Is there no barrier between you and Christ? Is there no hindrance between you and God? Have you then noticed that this promise is unto you and to your children, and to as many as the Lord our God shall call, even the people that are far off, the Gentiles who are far off here in Nigeria? afar off from Jerusalem. He says, the promise is unto you. And right now, if we're ready, if we've been expecting, and we're looking for this power to come upon us, as we pray, we must believe God. Let me end up with the promise that God has given us in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? If we know how to receive good things from our earthly parents, how much more, how much more, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Ask therefore in verse 9, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Rise up and let us pray. We receive by faith and not by feeling. We receive by trusting God, not by trying hard. We receive by resting on him not by fighting for it we receive by claiming the promise as ours it is the same Lord that saved you that will also baptize you in the Holy Ghost not man it is Jesus, your Lord, your Savior, your Sanctifier, that also baptizes in the Holy Ghost. 